If you've been following Artists on the Verge at all, you may have noticed that an overall question is starting to crystallize for me. What is the actual value of art, and how might that value inform the decisions of individual artists, especially those trained in high art forms? There are many ways we might approach this question, but today I'd like to approach it through anthropology and an essay called The Arts After Darwin, Does Art Have an Origin and Adaptive Function? The author, anthropologist Ellen DeSanayaka, is best known for three books on art anthropology, What is Art For? from 1988, Homo Aestheticus, Where Art Comes From and Why? in 1992, and Art and Intimacy, How the Arts Began from the year 2000. I chose to read the essay Arts After Darwin, which was published in 2008 as a chapter in a book on world art studies, not just because it's a shorter standalone piece, but also because it is general enough to serve as an introduction for someone like me who isn't an anthropologist. It was also published after Desanyake's three main books on art anthropology, so she had completed the bulk of her research into the subject by the time she wrote this. Not to mention that recency is very important when considering academic writing, especially when there's a scientific aspect to it. So that's why I chose this particular essay, and after you listen to it, I'd love to know if you find an anthropological paper like this at all useful as someone who is a practicing artist wondering about how you might make your way. I'm going to read the essay in two parts. In this first part, which you are listening to now, we'll hear Disanayaka's argument for why it might be useful to see art as an adaptation in the Darwinian sense, and we'll hear a summary of various hypotheses by other researchers on how exactly art might have an adaptive function, though Disanayaka ultimately wishes to put forth a different hypothesis altogether. So with no further ado, let's delve into some art anthropology. Okay, this is The Arts After Darwin, Does Art Have an Origin and Adaptive Function? by Ellen Disanayaka. Introduction. Like medieval cosmology, which placed the earth and man at the center of the universe, the long philosophical tradition of Western art history and aesthetics considered Western man and his accomplishments to be the measure of all things. This chauvinism was due in part to necessary ignorance, Our scholarly forebears could not have known about the cognitive complexity of the languages and kinship systems of the people they considered to be, quote, savages. Nor could they have been acquainted with other of these people's intellectual and artistic achievements, the richly carved masawa or ceremonial seagoing canoes of the Trabriand Islanders, the soaring facades of the House Tambaran of the Sepik River area of northern New Guinea, or the impressive bisjay poles of the Asmat of coastal Irian Jaya, to mention only a few. The founders of Western art theory were necessarily also unaware of the astonishing galleries of Paleolithic cave paintings in France, Spain, and elsewhere. So Disanayaka is instantly setting up uh, this idea of the high art world, which, of course, if you remember my reading the essay Another Art World, is this kind of recurring idea of Western art history being somehow too exclusive and ignoring basically what art actually is. But here we have it more from like an actually anthropological point of view, more than maybe a Western philosophical point of view. Although the many 21st century scholars in the arts and humanities now wish to redress this neglect and incorporate the works and worldviews of non-Western humans into their studies, they remain encumbered by another legacy of their 2,500-year-old intellectual heritage. I think what she's talking about 2,500 years old is just from Greco-Roman history, kind of Greek, ancient Greece up until now, I believe. I refer to the Western humanity's ignorance of and resistance to the implications of Darwinism, the news that humans have evolved over millennia from simpler forms. Yet it is only by accepting this momentous fact of nature that today's scholars can truly broaden the humanities to include humanity, the lives, minds, and works of people in all societies and historical periods, including prehistory. Such broadening requires that one understand the human species' evolutionary history and its evolved psychology. In particular, the engagement with the arts is an integral and necessary, adaptive, part of a common human nature. 
So here, Jista Nayake lays out her thesis, which is basically that art must be seen as an adaptive function, or not must be seen, but that she posits that it is an adaptive function, that it therefore can be kind of explained through a Darwinian point of view. And basically the whole essay is her arguing how that changes how we would think of art if we accept it as some kind of adaptive um, human function. To adopt a human nature, or quote, adaptionist point of view, accepting that human bodies, brains, and behavior, including making and experiencing the arts, evolved to enable individual survival and reproduction in ancestral environments, is a revolution in worldview for the humanities that can be likened to replacing a geocentric with a heliocentric perspective in cosmology. So she's saying basically, if we accept a truly Darwinian point of view on art, or understanding of art, that'll be kind of like when, I guess, early modern times, we switched from regarding the Earth as the center of the universe to understanding the sun to be the center of our solar system. Having adopted such a perspective, one can go on to study particulars and levels far more specialized than the cosmic or taxonomic, but will have gained new tools for framing questions and can avoid spending time on fruitless Ptolemic paths. For example, knowledge of how and why the brain has evolved to work as it does brings new perspectives to bear on some classical philosophical problems, like how we perceive and, quote, know aesthetic objects, and disposes of others, like the assumption of mind-body dualism or of the duality of cognition and emotion and aesthetic response. So she's basically saying that downriver from adopting a Darwinian understanding of the arts, there's all these shifts that we would have to make um, in our approach. One of them would be how we would even identify objects of art, how we would kind of define what a piece or an act of art might be. And by the way, one of uh, Disanayaka's uh, kind of contributions is this idea that art, of the idea of artification and this idea that maybe art shouldn't be seen as an object or a thing, but as an act. That is um, a, a verb going from a noun to a verb, which is interesting. The adaptionist principle of the unity of species nature is able to provide an underlying framework in which to address what is now an incoherent mishmash of concerns within the humanities about identity, authenticity, relativism, the crisis of representation, and the consequences of globalization. So she, she claims that a lot of the squabbles about um, identity representation, uh, who should be making what art and what is authentic art, and a crisis of representation, which is maybe more conservative in the sense that there's no more representation and everything maybe is abstract, um, or the consequences of globalization, I guess that's my soapbox, um, that all of that would go out the window if we adopt more of an adaptationist point of view on art, which is to say a Darwinian point of view and see art as a survival adaptation. Influential organizing principles of 19th and 20th century intellectual discourse, such as Marxian interpretation of history, Freudian psychoanalysis, Jungian archetypes, or structuralist mythographies can be reframed or discarded when one recognizes that principles of human action arise fundamentally from an evolved human nature. Different circumstances produce different responses in different individuals, but these individuals have the same underlying psychobiological needs. Jared Diamond's Compendium of World History, Geography, and Biology in Guns, Germs, and Steel from 1997 is a brilliant example of understanding human diversity, including artistic expression, within an underlying framework of species unity. So she's basically just, this is, that's how academic prose works. She's just kind of reframing uh, and supporting, further supporting her thesis that we need to see art not as the work of a single tradition, because of course, when you go to a conservatory and when you go study high art, when we think of high art as people like Ellen herself uh, that are part of the West, we tend to think of a certain artistic tradition at the expense of or, or exclusion of all other artistic traditions, of which there are many, many in the world. And she says it would be more useful if we simply saw art as a fundamental aspect of human nature, which has some kind of adaptive function and which, which addresses our fundamental psychological needs rather than the product of a particular tradition against which all art should be measured, right? In this chapter, I shall briefly, one, Suggest that art is an adaptation. She has already done that, but I guess she'll she'll further support that. Two, 
counter misconceptions about evolution and one of its core concepts, function. So she's going to explain a little bit better what Darwinism actually is because she says actually that there's a lot of misconceptions of, of what that means. Three, survey four major current adaptationist hypotheses for the evolutionary origin and function of the arts. Four, propose a common denominator of art and introduce the notion of making special, expand upon and defend this hypothesis. <laughs> and six, suggest implications of adopting a humanity-centered art history and aesthetics. So subchapter one, considering art as an adaptation. There are two major problems with considering art to be an evolved or adaptive component of human nature. The first problem is shared with all who hope to say anything useful about art. What is it that one is talking about? What is art? For now, let us simply include in this concept the activities that are commonly and loosely thought of as, quote, the arts. Music, dance, literary language, visual ornamentation and representation, dramatic performance, and return to the question again in section four. Basically, she's just saying, we're going to talk about what art actually is later. For now, just imagine what you usually imagine under arts, and that's, just, you know, music, dance, literature, visual arts, um, and decoration, and then also drama. So basically how we see art normally today. The second problem is restricted to evolutionary psychologists or adaptationists who view all physical and psychological efforts as being directed towards the ultimate ends of survival and reproduction. What is art's adaptive function? The ability to make a weapon or a canoe presumably contributes to personal welfare and fitness, but careful decoration of these objects would seem to take time and effort that could be better used in more obviously beneficial activity. The arts, singing, dancing, drumming, complex performances, and the lavish ornamentation of bodies or surroundings are costly, highly energetic activities whose ultimate benefits are not immediately apparent. One eminent evolutionist has, in fact, forcefully declared that music, and by implication the other arts, is not an adaptation, but rather a byproduct of other adaptations. And that was Steven Pinker, apparently. Yet certain observations suggest that art, or the arts, might well be adaptive. A. The arts are observable cross-culturally in members of all known societies, regardless of their degree of economic or technological development. B. Their traces are evident in our ancestral past, as we find from at least 100,000 years ago with the use of red ochre and subsequent material artifacts. C. Their rudiments are detectable and easily fostered in the behavior of young children, as when babies and toddlers spontaneously move to music, sing along or alone, make marks, decorate their bodies and possessions, play with words, find pleasure in rhythm and rhyme, or enjoy make-believe. D. They are generally attractants and sources of pleasure, like other adaptive behaviors such as mating, parenting, resting, or being with familiars in warm and safe surroundings. The arts occur under appropriate and adaptive conditions or circumstances. That is, they are typically about important life concerns, as in ceremonies that mark stages of life or that concern prosperity, safety, and subsistence. F. They are costly. Large amounts of time, physical and psychological effort, thought, and material resources are devoted to the arts as to other biologically important activities such as sex, finding, preparing, and consuming food, socializing and gaining social acceptance, helping close kin, talking with friends, and acquiring useful information. Especially in small-scale or subsistence societies, art behavior consumes resources far beyond what one would expect for an unimportant activity. A trait, activity, or behavior meeting these requirements is a candidate for being considered adaptive. And she actually includes a footnote, and she says here, according to evolutionary psychologists Leda Cosmid Cosmides and John Tooby, who published this in 1992, Adaptations are characterized by economy, efficiency, complexity, precision, specialization, reliability, and effect. And De Sanayake argues that art meets these criteria, but that there's not time to kind of elaborate on that. So sub-chapter two, misconceptions about evolution and functionalism. Evolutionary theory is the central unifying concept in modern biology. For a century and a half, its claims have been tested by countless scientists who overwhelmingly accept its validity and fruitfulness. 
Controversies within the field of evolution concern not the fact of evolution, but rather the mechanisms by which it happens. The theory of evolution has been essential to developments in modern medicine, epidemiology, agriculture, and pharmaceuticals on which our daily lives depend. Yet most people are both uninformed and skeptical about the very idea, particularly when it is applied to humans. Half of American adults, for example, deny evolution as a fact of nature. And for nearly a century in the United States, religious zealots have sought to restrict or even ban the teaching of evolution in the public schools. So this is not an experience I have had, but but I guess, uh, you know, th these are studies that she's citing about, at least in the U.S., there being this weird skepticism about evolution as applied, especially to humans. Now, and I think she addresses this in the next paragraph, but of course, there's also people who, on the contrary, misuse this idea of competition and survival of the fittest to justify, you know, selfishness, basically. Both extremes have been a problem, the denial of evolution, but then also the kind of misunderstanding and misuse of the idea of evolution, especially in the 20th century, has been pretty devastating, right? Unfortunately, serious misunderstandings about the claims of evolutionary theory are as widespread and pernicious in the academy as they are in popular culture, where the word Darwinian is synonymous with cutthroat competition. So she's addressing that here. Terms such as survival of the fittest, nature red in tooth and claw, genetic determinism, or selfish were not used by Darwin himself and poorly convey the complexity of the theory they are thought to encapsulate. It should not be necessary to remind readers that current evolutionary thinking about humans, unlike that of some 19th century proponents, is neither hierarchical, with white European males at the top, nor determinist. Individuals are not in a perpetual struggle of each against all. Sympathy, generosity, and cooperation are as much a part of human nature as our self-interest, xenophobia, and aggression. So she's addressing this issue that Darwin, Darwinism, unfortunately, or this idea of, of evolution and this idea of the survival of the fittest and this kind of thing, which, by the way, she says up here, and that actually surprises me, that um, Darwin never used the term survival of the fittest. They have just been used, misused, especially like, you know, in the 19th century and 20th century, basically to, to justify a genocide, to justify slavery, to justify restricting opportunity. There can be a kind of unease with this idea of evolution and, and Darwinism and adaptation uh, because of this. But she's actually arguing uh, that use of Darwinism is a misunderstanding. And she says that adaptation, that sympathy, generosity and cooperation are in fact adaptations and part of our nature and part of what constitutes uh, what what supports our survival as much as self-interest. Um, so this cutthroat idea of Darwinism is actually incredibly uh, short-sighted. Evolutionists know that both environment and experience affect genetic expression so that the concept of genetic or any other, quote, determinism should be abolished along with the phrase nature or nurture. Culture, quote, nurture, is not an alternative to, but is part of biology, nature. Every human is born with an unstoppable preparedness to become cultural. Babies come into the world ready to interact socially with those around them, to learn to speak, to imitate, and wish to please, to accept the beliefs of their associates, and to play. These behaviors are evolved, adaptive predispositions. The means by which every human becomes enculturated in the ways of the group into which he or she is born. So she also rejects this idea of nature versus nurture, that basically we're born already ready to take uh, culture in. I, I guess the reason she's saying this is because this idea that if you are in a different, if two people are from different cultures, that they are somehow fundamentally different is also kind of wrong, because in fact, both of them were born already adapted already vessels for culture as such. So there are different, there are variants of culture, but they have these patterns to them, which have to do with how we are actually already structured with our, our biology, our, our DNA even. In contemporary anthropology, the concept of function has been discarded along with the explanatory modes of Durkheim, Milanovsky, and Radcliffe Brown, whose wide-ranging, quote, functionalist interpretation of society and culture have been replaced with the less ambitious and more focused and individualized studies. So here I feel like she's talking about like discourses within anthropology that, that I just don't know anything about because I'm not an anthropologist. So um, that would take a little bit more investigation on my part. 
As used by evolutionists today, however, functional explanations of human behavior bear little resemblance to anthropologists' assumptions about functionalism. They do not suggest, for example, that all parts of a society are interrelated or that individual behavior within a society perform some intrinsic function specific to that society. The concept of adaptive function need not be inflexible, hierarchical, or determinist, nor will it force individual instances of a functional, adaptive behavior, such as art, into a Procrustean bed of Western presumptions. Quite the contrary. The adaptionist idea is that behaviors are evolved predispositions that can be expressed in a variety of cultural and individual manifestations. So that's what I was saying earlier. She's trying to make a distinction between determinism, this idea that, you know, the the way that, for example, white supremacists used Darwinism was to say there is some perfect form to the human and there is a perfect, there is a culture which expresses this perfect form that, you know, that is one kind of what you would call a misinterpretation of Darwinism. And what she's saying is, no, we are all born ready to, to take in culture as humans. And culture is simply an extension of our human nature. And there is no culture which expresses human nature better than another culture. We are um, vessels for culture and culture is simply a natural extension of our biology, which all human beings on this planet share, if that makes sense. Adaptationist thinking requires functional explanation, as when noting that anatomical features have functions. Hands are used for handling and making, and eyes for seeing. Similarly, behaviors such as smiling, laughing, playing, or speaking, and behavioral categories such as courtship, mating, parenting, aggression, or food sharing have an adaptive function, often several functions. Over evolutionary time, apathetic and unsociable babies would not have thrived as well as their more interactive age mates, who would better survive to adulthood and pass on their genes to future generations. Adaptive explanations of behavior distinguish between two levels of functional explanation. Quote, proximate reasons for the behavior, its ostensible motivation and immediate emotional or psychological effect. Usually, this feels good or right. And it's quote, ultimate selective value. It's biologically adaptive end of contributing to individual fitness, survival, or reproductive success. So I guess, it, you know, with art, uh, this the proximate reason is that it just feels good to make art, feels good, for example, to dance to, to the same music and to, 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 to share rhythm with others. This releases actually a lot of oxytocin. And so it, that's the proximate reason for this behavior. That's why we do it. But then the ultimate reason um, is the selective value. So human beings that participated in dancing together and had these oxytocin releases formed closer bonds with their communities and therefore were more likely to survive because in fact, we are utterly dependent on the communities that uh, we live in and, and, and always have been. That would be approximate and an ultimate value of something like dancing together. Obviously, one rarely acts from a conscious decision or intention to survive or transmit one's genes to future generations. It is proximate emotional desires and satisfactions that motivate and reward adaptive behaviors such as courtship and mating, caring for children, defending against an aggressor, sharing food with one's kin and intimates, and participating in art. These desires and satisfactions, products of brain activity, have evolved to motivate adaptive behavior. People engage with the arts for many proximate reasons, to express their inner selves, to demonstrate their devotion to a deity, to earn a living, to assure a successful hunt, to please a client, to impress others, to while away the time for entertainment and pleasure. One can quickly compile a long list from looking at examples of the arts in various small-scale societies, as well as from examining aesthetic theories proposed by people who had no interest in a biological or adaptionist explanation. So, yeah, she's just saying people engage in arts for proximate reasons, but that doesn't mean that there is not some deeper um, ultimate reason for this art. I mean, that's that seems pretty self-evident to me, but I guess that's the thing about academic prose is that it's constantly supporting itself and over-supporting and re-supporting itself. An adaptationist view of art should seek to describe 
approximate function or functions of art that can plausibly be shown to fulfill the ultimate function of contributing to survival or reproductive success. So that's what we said. If we take an adaptionist or Darwinian view of art, you're going to be describing approximate function. Why do people in the moment want to do this action? Why do they want to make this piece of art? Why do they want to dance? Why do they want to sing at that moment? And then how does that act ultimately contribute to the survival of that individual or that community? It is not necessarily that each instance of art contributes to these ends, exactly. So it's not that every time that someone is making a piece of art, they're, you know, it's like some point system, like a video game where you get points, survival points or something. It's more complicated than that, obviously. No more than each instance of altruism or mating. So it's not like every time people have sex, they fulfill the, quote, ultimate reason for sex because, well, also human beings have sex for many, many other reasons besides just creating more human beings. Um, not every act of altruism is necessarily instantly returned or returned at all, right? That doesn't mean that altruism and mating don't have some kind of very profound effect on our survival, right? However, in the way of life in which the adaptation evolved, those who possess the adaptation, so in this case, art making, those who possess, let's say, the community that possesses the art making, would have tended to survive and reproduce better than those who did not. So she, she's saying this uh, as a fact, but basically that is if you believe in an adaptationist point of view, you must believe that making art, the communities that made art simply survived better than those that did not. And so the question is now why? So this is subchapter number three, current adaptive hypotheses of art. Disanayaka is going to now go through some of the hypotheses that exist about maybe why art might be actually adaptive, might actually uh, contribute to individual and group survival. Since about 1990, a growing number of scholars with an evolutionary grounding have published book length and shorter treatments about the evolutionary function of one or another art, some of which are summarized in this paragraph for readers who are interested in exploring the subject. So the rest of this paragraph is just references to all these different papers and books that have been written about the possible adaptive value of art. So if you're interested in that, I've linked to this essay in the show notes. Um, it's on just the first paragraph of page seven. Rather than describe each author's claims individually, please note what a great service Disanayaka is doing for us right now by parsing all of these material, all of this this literature that she lists above, um, and she just kind of divides it into into four uh, simple simpler um, ideas. That's really great. Some views straddle categories, and I am aware that particular proponents of a hypothesis may feel that I have oversimplified or, or, or overgeneralized their position. All right, well, but for us beginners <laughs> that aren't necessarily anthropologists, I think this is a, probably a good start, I assume. So here we go. The first uh, possibility for why arts might be adaptive is improving cognition. The arts contribute to problem solving and making better adaptive choices. This function includes proposals from several bioevolutionary approaches to the arts. Self-labeled Darwinian or, quote, evolutionary aesthetics, which despite its label has little, if anything, to do with aesthetics as philosophers have used the term, addresses preferences for features that influence choices of desirable habitats, healthy and fertile sexual partners, and other judgments that would affect fitness in ancestral environments. For the range of subject matter, see the essays and bibliographies in Voland and, Gram uh, and Grammar in 2003. So she's just referencing some other uh, scholarship. Although they do not deal directly with artworks or art activities, some of these studies have contended that present day responses to the arts may be derived from the ancestrally adaptive preferences, like for symmetry of bodies and faces, that they investigate. I mean, so basically the idea that, you know, juicy fruit was good, therefore we like uh, things that look like juicy fruit. I feel like commercial culture has tapped into that more so than, than necessarily art. In a related vein, neurologists of vision who practiced neuroaesthetics show how evolved perceptual psychology underlies our appreciation of visual art. The function of art is to, quote, represent the constant, lasting, essential, and enduring features of objects, surfaces, faces, situations, and so on, and thus allow us to acquire a deeper knowledge of them. These neurocognitivists do not treat the sort of multimedia and participative arts that presumably characterized early humans, but use examples from masterpieces of 
Western visual art to illustrate their claims. Interesting. So, I mean, she, she's saying this having said that she believes that um, we shouldn't focus only on Western art to understand art. So clearly, I would say, I would assume that she is not really on board with this particular hypothesis. Uh, the hypothesis that art is supposed to train us to understand objects and surfaces and faces and situations better. A third cognitivist approach addresses the human appetite for fictional stories, which on the face of it would seem to be maladaptive in a species that relies on the transmission of accurate information. Following Darwinian aesthetics theorists, and early theorists of children's play, these hypotheses claim that fiction safely presents vicarious experience of adaptive information to cognitive systems that are involved with foresight, planning, and empathy, thereby providing risk-free practice for later life when similar circumstances might arise. I mean, that seems pretty logical to me, and I, I, I would say that probably um, stories do, are, to some extent, do some, to some extent have that function, that they allow us to... Um, kind of imagine ourselves in situations without having to necessarily live them. Imagine ourselves facing death without having to necessarily face it, for example. I actually kind of like that idea, although I clearly not all art is about that. Um, Scalise Sugiyama, uh, 2001, has examined folk tales from around the world to demonstrate that in fictional narrative, people acquire accurate information about local habitats that may contribute to their fitness. So, I mean, yeah, like a lot of fairy tales, for example, contain information about like plants, like which plants you should eat and this kind of thing. Um, so it's basically just a way to, to kind of share knowledge. So that was like the, the first cluster of um, hypotheses, which is uh, that art contributes to problem solving and making better adaptive uh, choices. Uh, but you could, she listed three very different approaches to that basic um, I idea of art, right? So B, propaganda. The arts are used to manipulate, deceive, indoctrinate, or control other people. Interesting. Insofar as art directs attention and emotion to messages, it can be used subversively to the benefit of the art maker. Surveying a wide folklore literature, Scalise uh, Sugiyama makes a case for storytelling as a means of political manipulation and fitness enhancement. Power, that's a name, in 1999, offers an unusual argument supported by studies of rituals described in sub-Saharan African ethnographies that visual art and dance originated when ancestral females, participating as a group, painted their bodies with red ochre in order to attract males, who assumed they were menstruating and hence fertile, receptive to courtship and, and eventual insemination, <laughs> thereby gaining gifts of meat and valuable resource. So that's kind of a weird example um, of manipulation through art, but okay. Um, so C, so the third cluster of, of possible hypotheses on the adaptive function of art is sexual display. The arts promote mating opportunity through display of desirable qualities like physical beauty, intelligence, creativity, prestige, which denote fitness. At present, the most popular and influential evolutionary explanation of the adaptive value of art is the sexual selection hypothesis, derived from Darwin's speculation about the extravagant plumage or elaborate songs of some male birds. Yeah, I've heard of this hypothesis that basically art is just an elaborate um, mating game. Like it's just like when birds sing uh, or, or um, have elaborate feathers like peacocks. Noting that these conspicuous ex excesses would seem to impede locomotion or attract predators and therefore be non-adaptive, Darwin suggested that splendidly colorful tales or lusty songs must instead be courtship devices for attracting the attention and sexual favors of females. A 20th century examination of such, quote, costly signals by Zahavi and Zahavi, 97, proposed that they honestly convey to prospective mates and to potential predators that their owners have unusual vigor. Weak or sickly males could not, quote, fake such clear signs of vitality, which for them would be handicaps rather than advertisements. Um, I've heard that smoking is also this kind of thing, like that, pe that the reason people smoke is to just show like, I am so fit that I can literally poison my body and I'm fine. The ornamental character of plumes, crests, tails, and songs in birds provides an obvious analogy with human arts, which are claimed also to be honest, costly signals since the strength, vitality, intelligence, skill, and creativity required for their display cannot be faked by those who are less well endowed. 
The arts thus are seen to be an arena for competition, advertising fitness, and therefore leading to reproductive opportunity through female choice. So she says female choice, and what that would imply that art making, art making is only for men, even in our species, which clearly just, it, it just isn't the case. Now, I do think that multiple reasons for art can be happening at the same time, and this may very well be one of them, but I don't think it should be seen as the only one. D. So the, the fourth cluster of possible explanations for the evolutionary uh, adaptive function of art, reinforcing sociality. The arts enhance cooperation and contribute to social cohesion and continuity. Despite the popularity of the sexual selection hypothesis, countless ethnographic accounts attest to the contribution of the arts to sociality and cooperation. Evolutionary psychologists have then contributed to art important social functions, such as augmenting the impact of ritual, thereby strengthening religion's power to cement group cohesion, indicating group membership with dress or badges, enabling behavioral coordination and neural entertainment through rhythmic movement and ritualized participation in temporally organized performance, and inculcating, quote, descent amity. Um, descent amity, I think it's like connection to your closest kin, maybe. Um, I'm sorry, I looked it up and I couldn't find what that means. Based on extensive fieldwork in Spain, Colombia, Ecuador, and the southwestern United States, Coe's ancestress hypothesis described how the visual arts transmit traditions within kin groups, especially by mothers to children, and encourage cooperation among those identified as co-descendants of a common ancestor. Carroll puts the general argument well when he argues that, quote, the arts are indispensable for the organization of shared experience that makes collective cultural life possible. So basically the idea that it connects people and it allows um, information to be and tradition to be passed down from generation to generation. It is obvious that all four hypotheses, so she's finished, I guess, uh, the, the four hypotheses of why art might be have an adaptive function. Just to review, the first one was improving cognition. So it helps us kind of sort through the world and um, understand uh, better how to survive in it. Uh, propaganda, so it serves to trick others to think things that perhaps aren't true, but that are to our benefit. Um, sexual display, so it helps us be more desirable mates, basically the same way birds do it. <laughs> um, reinforcing sociality um, is the fourth one, which is both bringing communities together and then allowing um, passing the passing down of knowledge to one's direct kin. It is obvious that all four hypotheses are plausible in at least some instances. Everyone can think of examples that appear to perform these functions, and each function can be shown to contribute to survival or reproductive success. All make welcome contributions to a greater appreciation of the deep-rootedness and variety of artful characteristics in our species. Yet I maintain that most of the arguments for these hypotheses are inadequate for understanding art as a broader, evolved, and adaptive phenomenon. Some are too narrow, focusing on one art, like body decoration, or one evolved capacity, like visual perception. Most are conceptually vague, using the word art imprecisely and frequently conflating it with other concepts with which art is often but not universally associated or equated. So uh, Disanayaka has done us a great service by kind of summing up the literature so far, at least until 2008, of hypotheses of why art might have an adaptive function. And I think it's actually, as she admits, it kind of all has a bit of truth to it. But she's saying that she feels like none of them are actually satisfying because they're either vague, they're either too specific about what they examine, or they're too vague about how they even identify what art is. For example, she says, in some of the cognitive explanations, art is treated as being synonymous with or equivalent to beauty, defined circularly as a pleasurable and thus adaptive sensory or cognitive preference. Or art is located in visual stimuli that excite perceptual response to color, line, and form. Yet in experiences of art, one responds to more than adaptive preferences, say for the salubrious landscapes and to more than single qualities such as color, shape, and line. 
By considering aesthetic response to be any adaptive preference and by defining beauty as what is highly preferred and enjoyed, Darwinian aesthetics does not distinguish experiences of art from any other pleasurable or adaptive experience. So she's kind of uh, criticizing, I think, mostly some of the ideas in the first cluster of uh, adaptive functions, the idea that it helps our cognition. So she's criticizing it because she says, well, if you're just saying that art is there to reinforce what we find beautiful, because what we find beautiful is landscapes which are fertile or human beings who are fertile, if that's all, why would we need a separate field of art which makes those representations? Why couldn't we just uh, aesthetically appreciate the landscape around us and human beings around us who are fertile? Why would we have to create art in order to represent those things? I guess. Similarly, Scalise Suguyama's discussion of narrative are wide-ranging, useful, and well-supported. That was the last hypothesis in that cluster of, of hypotheses that said art was um, something that improved our cognition. The one that said fiction is a way for us to kind of live through hypothetical experiences and learn from them without actually having to be, for example, in danger or something like that. So similarly, uh, Skali Suguyama's discussion of narrative are wide-ranging, useful, and well-supported, but the adaptive advantages, she notes, lie in the information content of any narrative, not in what about it might be art. So again, I guess she's saying like, okay, well, if it's about passing on information, I guess why not just, why would we need a set, an art form in order to pass on that information? And what about the passing on of that information in the form of fiction as art, as opposed to not art, I guess. Few would consider a newspaper story, a museum guide to an exhibition, a diary entry, an electronic message, or a joke, art, even though all are narratives or stories that provoke useful knowledge or can manipulate others' behaviors. Sometimes, you know, journalism and diary entries and kind of, uh, let's say, theoretical works about art or jokes are sometimes seen as art. So that's constantly that that's fluid, right? It's constantly shifting. So but I guess she's also she's still in this idea of like, you know, high art and why why is high art defined in a certain way, I guess. Advocates of the sexual selection, now she's going to critique the sexual selection hypothesis. Advocates of the sexual selection hypothesis focus on art as being costly display of the artist's beauty, virtuosity, skill, and creativity. Yet these features too are not in themselves art, but broader entities that some but not all instances of art may have or use. Convert so she's just saying, you know, art as, as something like birdsong and bird feathers um, is, you know, might apply to some art, but it doesn't apply to it universally. And she's saying, I want a universal, I want a universal explanation for art making. Conversely, they are also to be found outside the arts, as later examples will show. Granted, art is frequently beautiful, skillful, or costly, as in the ritualized presentation of beautifully garbed, marriageable young women, the tireless dancing of impressively masked and costumed men, the displays of wealth such as decorated yams in Papua New Guinea, or the prestige of feather headdresses of Polynesian chieftains. But so are other things a colorful bird or a field of flowers, a perfectly executed gymnastic feat, an ingot of gold. What specifically makes artful instances of beauty, virtuosity, skill, and creativity different from the non-artful ones? That is, again, that, so that's what I was saying earlier. What is the aesthetic appreciation of, for example, a sunset, which is not art because it's a naturally occurring thing? How do we kind of theoretically distinguish that from the representation of a sun sunset? Why are those two different, you know? What, what is fundamentally different about those? Because something is fundamentally different about those. In other words, one must still specify what additional capacity, quote, art, has been selected for. Additionally, a closer look at some hypotheses reveals that they neglect important features of the arts in pre-modern societies. Contra the sexual selection hypothesis, in many traditional societies, arts are typically, if not always, conservative. Originality and creativity, so important in Western arts, recently at least, are often discouraged. Traditional arts may not necessarily be even beautiful or skilled, as in Yupik paintings where stylized simple representation to accompany a story is valued over aesthetic effect. Often several arts occur and are experienced concurrently, unlike modern society's arts, which typically reside in museums, concert halls, and books created, performed, and experienced by specialists who individually practice or appreciate these individual manifestations of painting, chamber music, or literature. 
In traditional societies, an entire group may make the art and join in its performance. As Chernoff says, the most fundamental aesthetic in Africa is that without participation, there is no meaning. And she's saying here something which, which might echo if you've um, listened to some of my other stuff where I read about um, art communism, which was based on this idea that everyone is an artist. I actually listened to uh, an interview with uh, Disa Nayaka, and she actually said this, that, that in traditional societies, everyone is an artist. And then there's also this observation by this Chernoff uh, person about this being the most fundamental aesthetic in Africa, that there has to be participation in the art. Uh, such considerations suggest that adaptive hypotheses or humanistic proposals for art's function that are based on a single art, a single artist, as a, quote, genius or as fitness maximizer at the expense of others. So we're going back to that everyone is an artist thing, right? Or a single or no function require modification, as do hypotheses that presuppose the necessity to art of beauty or skill. So she's basically saying that if you look at all of these hypotheses, they'd always exclude something. Um, some of them uh, assume that art is supposed to be aesthetically pleasing and that it's supposed to be skillful. They assume that art is supposed to be made by a single artist and not uh, participatory in nature. And or they assume art to be a certain kind of activity and exclude activities which could go under art, which could could exist under that umbrella, but because they don't look like Western art, um, usually, I think that's what she's saying, is that there's just this kind of Western bias about what goes under the art umbrella and how what goes under that umbrella um, is actually defined and what it's like. So uh, even though this is kind of a maybe a, a early place to, to stop. I'm going to stop here. And next time we're going to be hearing more about Disanayaka's own ideas of what art actually means that she thinks is actually a unifying theory as opposed to just these disparate theories, which all have some truth in them, which I think is why it's, it's useful to hear about them, but which don't provide what Disanayaka would think of probably as like a unifying, truly satisfying theory of art, regardless of culture. I hope you enjoyed this first part of Ellen Disanayaka's essay on the adaptive function of art. Does any of this help you make sense of what you're doing as an artist or an aficionado of the arts? Let me know. And subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so I can let you know when I publish the second part of this essay. The best way to keep up with artists on the verge is to sign up for the newsletter that comes out on the 13th of every month, linked in the description. Here's to being on the verge.